Thank you for joining today's webinar, Feeding Sheep Despite the Late Rain. I'm Jodie Rizzo O'Brien and I'm part of the Sheep Connect SA team. Tonight's webinar is supported by Australian Wool Innovation, Meat and Livestock Australia, the Containment U PDS project with Barossa Grazing Group, South Australian Sheep Industry Fund, the Murray Lands and Riverland Landscape Board, and the Northern York Landscape Board, through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Programme and the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund and the Landscape Levies. So just a bit about Sheep Connect, it's supported by Australian Wool Innovation, the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund and the Department of Primary Industries and Regions. If you want more information on Sheep Connect, please visit our website or follow us on Twitter. Tonight's presenter is Deb Scammell. Deb's a livestock consultant at Talking Livestock based in the mid-north of South Australia. She assists producers with nutrition and production planning in their sheep and beef enterprises. Over the last few years, Deb has been keenly involved in improving performance in lamb feedlots and feeding ewes in containment due to the poor, due to poor seasonal conditions. Prior to starting her own business, Deb worked in the commercial nutrition space in several different roles, covering technical, sales and national management of ruminant businesses. At this time, I'll hand over to Deb, who will talk to us about feeding sheep. Thanks, Deb. Thanks very much, Jody, and thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, tonight's topic will be talking about feeding despite the late break. So I love when we schedule these sessions. I feel like we always end up with a bit of rain before we start talking about dry time feeding, which is great because um, as you guys all know, we've been waiting a long time for this break. Um, but unfortunately, it's not going to turn things around instantly. So that's what we'll be covering tonight. So I'm going to cover through um, the current season and feed implications for your stock. Um, we're also going to talk about animal requirements, um, stock condition and how to monitor their condition, and then also effective supplementation and which feeds are going to be best for you over the next few months when you're feeding, um, you know, in a lot of cases, late pregnant and lactating ewes. So I'm happy if you need any clarification or have any questions to so type them in that question box and Jody will inter um, interrupt me so I can answer them on the way through. So if you're not sure on something, put it out there so you're not wondering the whole thing. Um, but we should have a fair bit of time for questions at the end. So as you guys know, um, where we're at at the moment, um, I've used some data from the Barossa Grazing Group soil moisture probes. Um, so this records growing season rainfall and there's a lot of these also through the southeast Flurio and mid north where you can monitor how the season's looking compared to the average. So we're looking at um, rainfall here from the 1st of April through to 8th of June. Um, so we've got, you know, 2020 you can see on the left hand side here and where we're sitting currently in 2021. So, you know, in our normal break time we are sitting you know, down to sort of half or less of where we would normally be. And this is reflected in the soil moisture in the profile. So, you know, as of 8th of June, so yesterday, um, you know, Flaxman Valley, not too far behind, but the other areas, you know, especially Canunga there, we're looking at a substantial decrease in soil moisture in the soil moisture profile. So, you know, it's exactly what you guys are seeing day to day. It's just the lack of feed um, and just that real short grain pick in the paddocks in some areas um, through to still dirt in other areas. So, uh, you know, tough when we're at our highest peak, I guess, of animal production for autumn lambers. So, you know, what I'm sort of looking at, I guess, when we're doing feed budgets is how fast the pasture is actually going to grow. So when we're looking at pasture growth rates, um, we're measuring it in kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. Um, so this graph just shows you on the left-hand side here, um, the kilograms it's growing and just the months of the year. So, you know, obviously January, February, we have pretty low growth. Um, we've got here the dark line is at Roseworthy, um, the middle line's Crystal Brook and the dark other line's Mallee. Um, the lower one. So yeah, I'm looking sort of as we come through to June, July, due to the low soil temperatures, um, you know, we are only looking sort of 15 to 20 kilos per hectare per day. Um, and I normally look at, you know, potentially loading ewes and lambs up at relatively high stocking rates, especially on grazing cereals. 
Um, so we need to be aware that, you know, the growth rates are substantially lower because of the cold temperatures, but also just because we haven't got, um, you know, in a lot of cases to that two to three leaf stage even, um, you don't have a lot of leaf area for the plant to grow quickly. So, you know, looking at other types of feeds, um, this is through the southeast, um, you know, looking at similar with your annual grasses, we're looking there that green line in a good year, um, you're going to be up around, you know, that 30 to 40 kilos, even as we go into August. Um, in a standard year, we're dropping right back here. Um, and then in a, in a poor year, um, we're even lower again with growth rate. So the blue line down the bottom here. So, you know, with the lack of rainfall we've had at the start of the year, um, you're not going to expect growth rates much more than 20 kilos per hectare per day. So it's important that we take account of that when we're working out our budgeting of pastures and pasture growth over the next two months. So I'm looking at with feed budgeting, you know, even though we've had relatively good rain in most areas in South Australia, um, it still is going to be a six to eight week feed budget we're looking at, especially with lambs on the ground and lactating use. So I'll just introduce you to a little bit of terminology so I don't lose some of you through. So um, I'm just going to go through a little bit on energy requirements and how they change over the cycle for a pregnant ewe um, or if you're trying to maintain stock. So when we look at energy, um, it's closely correlated to the digestibility of feed. So the digestibility of feed is basically, you know, if the animal's consuming that grass and it's 70% digestible, if they're eating 10 kilos, the proportion used would be seven kilos at 70% digestibility and three kilos is then passing out on the dung. So with short grain feed, it is highly digestible. Um, so we'll be looking at, you know, 70 to 80% digestibility in some cases, which will correlate to high energy feed. The problem we have is there's not a lot of it. So yeah, energy is measured in megajoules per kilo of dry matter of the feed. Um, so we'll go through this on the coming slides. So when I look at the energy requirement of a U, we're basically looking at for a 60 kilo U, we're looking at 10 megajoules a day, and that's just to maintain the U in the same condition that it was. So that's just to keep the body functioning um, and maintaining without that U losing or putting on weight. Um, with autumn lammers, where we're sitting now, the issue is through this sort of late break spell, we've got this sharp increase. So the top line here is the twin bearing ewes um, and we've got the single bearing ewes behind. So by the time you get to the point of lambing, you're around 18 megajoules for the twin bearing ewe and back around 15 or 16 for a single bearing ewe. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, a lot of our Merino ewes in SA are around that 70 kilos now. So the requirements are going to be even higher than that again. Um, and I'm looking forward, I guess, you know, I've seen a lot of clients over the last month um, that have lambs on the ground. They've got lactating twin ewes that are in this peak period. So 20 to 30 days after lambing, you've got that real peak requirement of lactation to keep those lambs alive and growing. So we're looking at close to 30 megajoules per day requirement for a twin bearing ewe and back around 23, 24 for a single bearing ewe. So, you know, you're looking from your maintenance at 10 megajoules through to sort of 30. So three times the amount to keep that twin bearing ewe in the same condition without it substantially losing condition. So as we talk over the next sort of half an hour, if you sort of keep that graph in mind, so anyone that's spring lambing, um, you're still going to go through this winter period um, with the sharper energy demands coming into lambing um, where you're going to have limited pasture growth. So it's still very relevant for you guys. So when we look at the condition of stock, I always probably focus initially on condition score. So um, you know, there has been some issues, I guess, where ewes weren't fed enough into lambing and they're already lambed down in a lower than required condition score. So 
We look at three as being the sort of benchmark three to three and a half for twin bearing use um, that we want them to lamb down in. And that means over lactation, if you can't supply that full energy, they do have a little bit more fat on their back. They can lose. So if you don't supply the full quantity, it's not an issue. But once we get down to condition score two and one, you do start getting into dangerous territory of you mortality. So in condition score three, um, we're feeling this region here behind the long ribs um, over the short ribs. Condition score three, the vertebrae are only slightly felt. Um, the, the eye muscle is filled in and you can feel the ends of each of the backbone um, and you can also feel the ends of the short ribs but your fingers don't go right between them so if anyone hasn't done much condition scoring you can get these cards um, from AWI Australian Wool Innovations or on their website and basically just have a feel of your own sheep and start to feel where they're sitting so you know I guess as we're talking um, you know there are going to be some use in that lower territory but we're hoping you know, to keep them in that three, three and a half, possibly lose a bit of condition over lactation, but have time to recover it before they're rejoined. So the reason we worry so much about condition score is just due to you mortality. So the problem with lambing ewes down um, or not having enough feed, you know, so this year we probably haven't had much feed in many areas to get ewes through. So there has been a heavy reliance on supplementary feed. So any ewes that have dropped, you know, a condition score less than two and a half for singles, you'll start to get that sharp increase in ewe mortality. Um, same as twin ewes, you know, once you get much lower than three, um, you'll have a sharp increase. You know, once they get down to two for a twin bearing ewe, you're up around that nine to 10% ewe mortality, which is incredibly high and costly to your business. So that's why we focus so much on condition score. We can do as many estimates we like on paddock feed and supplementary feed and energy amounts, but it's the sheep and the condition on that ewe that tells a story of how the supplementary feed and paddock feed is performing. And I guess the other focus during pregnancy, lactation and through to post weaning is due to what's going on inside that ewe. So I look at, um, you know, once a ewe is conceived, you've got during that first trimester, you've got the placental development happening here up to 90 days. So that's presetting the size of the lamb and where they're going to get their energy from as a fetus. So if they're too deprived, then um, you will end up with a smaller lamb. We then have for wool producing sheep like merinos, you'll have your primary follicles and your secondary follicles developing. And then post lambing, the follicles will mature. Um, we've got this in the last trimester, we've got this fetal growth. And then we've also got the udder development and colostral production of the ewe. So, you know, people still coming into lambing. It's just that critical period before lambing. If you use drop condition score, you'll have reduced size of the lamb, which can Im Im influence the, whether that lamb's going to survive. And then I'm looking now with autumn lambers that are feed, you know, lactating ewes. Um, the quantity of milk produced and the quality and colostrum is basically setting that lamb up for success through to weaning. So if you're depriving that ewe of too much nutrition, um, you're basically going to end up with lighter lambs um, and you end up with a lot of weaners suffering from sort of ill thrift. They just haven't reached their target weights. So that's what we're trying to avoid. So lamb survival, um, as I said, if the condition score of the ewe falls too much prior to lambing, you've got the twin lambs down the bottom here. You're basically getting them through to, you know, only four kilos if you can get them at three and a half, where a single lamb will be a lot heavier at the same condition score, just because the ewe is putting all that nutrition only into one lamb. So what we look at is lambing them down at optimum condition score. So we can optimise survival um, and birth weight of those lambs so we look at you know that five kilo point there is sort of a tipping point if they get too much heavier as you know you can have dystocia and issues with lambing um, if they get too much lighter they just don't have enough brown fat cover um, or energy to get up and survive any sort of weather conditions or cold events so that's why we're so focused on keeping those ewes in the right condition 
So as I've said, lactating you. So, you know, looking at this photo, this is pretty common around many areas. This is just through the mid north. So we've got this twin bearing ewe here. Um, you know, she's fairly well bagged up. There's little lambs and lactating ewes in that 20 to 30 days post lambing all over the place at the moment. So as I said, that's when their energy requirements peaking during that 20 to 30 day period. So we're looking at the flow on our effects, I guess, when you've got this twin bearing ewe. So you know, 30 megajoules per day requirement to adequately feed those two lambs. Um, we're looking at the growth rate that flows on then to those lambs through to weaning. Um, and then I also look at the ability of the ewe to recover through to the following joining. So if we're not providing supplement on this short green pick to that ewe, um, she's going to lose a lot of body condition. The lambs are going to struggle. Um, and then it will be hard for her to pick up and have a successful joining once you've weaned the lambs off. So that's what we're looking at at the moment with lactating ewes. So I guess the question is, you see ewes everywhere grazing green pick. And, you know, there's always that question of when you let the ewes out. So, you know, I utilise a lot of containment with people just to maintain ground cover on paddocks and make sure that paddocks can recover when we do have a rain event. But, you know, what is green pick worth and when is it adequate to give those ewes enough that you don't need to worry about supplementary feeding? So I look at short active growing green feed, like we're going to get after this rain, is um, close to 11 megajoules per kilo of dry matter. So it's got very high energy and it's um, very high digestibility. So as I said, digestibility is related to energy. It's very easy for that ewe to digest and get a lot out of that feed. Um, the problem we have is it's about 90% water. So as feed gets more mature, the fibre content goes up and you'll have less water and more dry matter in it. But when it's first growing, it's only about 10% dry matter um, and about 90% water. So this is where the issue lies. And when we measure feed on offer, we look at available feed. So when you look at a paddock like that, that's very low, um, short feed, we look at the ability of a ewe to harvest the amount it needs per day. So I look at if a ewe harvests a kilo of that green pick, there's actually only 100 grams of dry matter, which means that ewe is only getting 1.1 megajoule um, per kilo of green pick consumed. So remembering back to this twin here needing 30 megajoules, um, we're looking at her harvesting, you know, 26 kilos of that green pick a day. So I don't reckon there'd be a ewe anywhere that could harvest that much feed. So that's where we need to look at supplementary feeding to fill that gap of grain or full feed pellets or hay. So that's what we'll cover. But first, there's a few options, I guess, now that we've had some rain um, and a lot of people have already sown feed paddocks um, or have sort of permanent pastures that are going to respond to this rainfall. So we're looking at methods of maybe boosting some extra, extra pasture growth. So there's a few things you can look at here. So um, looking at your rear application. So... I look at this as a very good option and especially because um, particularly through the mid north and further north, um, a lot of the feeds only just germinated. Um, ewes are actually not on any of these feed paddocks yet. Most of them are lambing in smaller areas just because we haven't had the feed on offer in the paddocks. Um, so your rear application can be an, a good option. So you know, looking at around 80 kilos a hectare applied, um, you're looking at a cost of about $6 per hectare plus application costs. Um, the thing with applying urea is I recommend people sort of wait two to three weeks before they'd graze that paddock. So um, there's just a high risk of nitrate poisoning, especially if you have just come out of containment um, and aren't used to lush feed and then you've recently applied urea and put them out. So if you've got paddocks that have been sown, it's come up um, and use it elsewhere and you're waiting for it to grow enough to let them on, it could be an option to boost some growth with urea. The other option um, we're looking at is um, gibberellic acid. So 
with both of these worth touching base with your agronomist as to what's suitable. Um, but gibberellic acid basically is a natural plant hormone. So it stimulates plant growth through cell expansion. Um, it results in stem and leaf elongation of the plant and it will give you rapid growth. So within sort of, you know, a week or two, you get usually three to 400 kilos of extra dry matter in a paddock, um, but it's got to already be at that two to three leaf stage. So it's got the leaf matter to elongate. Um, so the cost of that's around $20 a hectare. So that can give you um, an instant sort of spike in growth and there's no withhold on that. So you can apply that with um, ewes and lambs on the paddock. So there's a really handy tool, um, Evergraze, and they've also got a really good stocking rate calculator where you can put the delayed sort of growth rates over winter and um, work out how many stock to put on your feed paddocks. But they also have this nitrogen and gibberellic acid tool um, so if you click on evergraze.com.au, go into tools, you can actually just put in the cost of supplementary feed versus applying nitrogen or gibberellic acid, and it will give you the payback of what's the most economical way to boost feed, whether it's supplementing or boosting a pasture paddock. So yeah, they're options it's worth chatting to your agronomist about. So I'll just touch a little bit more on some animal requirements and then we'll go through some supplementary feed quantities and um, feed budgeting. So we've been over this with the graph that I sort of said to keep in mind. Um, and this is going back to a 50 kilo U. So as we said, you know, your maintenance on a 50 kilo U, um, you know, looking at grazing is very low versus when they're in that early lactation period. Um, and then I also look at protein. So, you know, we do a lot of these calculations on energy, but you also need to look at the protein. So when are you lactating um, and late pregnancy? So late pregnancy, protein will help that lamb grow to an adequate birth weight. So particularly important in twins. Um, when they're lactating, you also need that protein just for them to produce adequate quantities of good quality milk for the lambs. Um, and as you can see with your weaners, you also have that high protein requirement when you're growing your weaners out. So it's worth looking at not only just energy of your supplements, but also protein. So I, I think I put this triangle into nearly every talk, but just pointing out, um, you know, the top of this triangle is what we're looking at with pastures that aren't adequate. So we're looking at supplying energy, protein and fibre. Um, there's definitely a requirement then for macro minerals like calcium and magnesium for lambing and lactating use. Um, but you always need to ensure you're ticking the box with energy, protein, fiber before you worry too much about your vitamins, micro minerals and macro minerals. Sorry, Deb, can you just go through the um, abbreviations you've used on the top of that triangle? Yep, yep. sorry. CBD, so yep. and, so and, yep. ME is metabolizable energy, um, which is the one we went through earlier that's measured in megajoules per kilo. So that's just the energy that animal requires to maintain the condition they're in. Um, CP is crude protein. So that's the protein um, that an animal needs, as we've just covered in lactation or to grow. Um, so yeah, proteins basically to build extra cells or for growing animals. Um, and then the bottom one is NDF, which is neutral detergent fiber. I'm actually going to cover that in a few slides time. So I'll go back to that one. But if you just remember that's fiber. So yeah, that's the three crucial things I like to look at when you're looking at essential nutrients for an animal. Um, yeah, then obviously, as I said, there's other micro and macro and vitamin requirements, but yeah, they're not as crucial, I guess, to tick off initially as the energy, protein and fiber. So looking at which feeds to supplement, I guess this is the most common question I get in years like this. And I, I guess, look at the most economical and cost effective way to supplement as well. So you know, encouraging initially um, everyone to feed test. So I've got an example of feed test results, but when we're looking at energy, protein and fiber requirements of an animal, um, it's really hard to work out in a dry season what they're satisfying if you don't have an exact feed test result. So when we look at barley grain, the top line there, um, we're looking at the dry matter percent of that grain initially. So that's just the amount of that that's dry matter. So we're 
you know, just under 89 percent dry matter um, which means just over 11 percent of that is water um, so it's the dry matter content of that grain that contains the goodness that the animal's wanting and the goodness then we have here is 12.3 megajoules per kilo dry matter of metabolizable energy so most barley this year has tested out around that 12 to 13 megajoules so quite good energy content per kilo dry matter of barley um, protein varies sort of between 9 and 13%. So most of you get protein on your silo slip. So you have a bit of an idea of how that's performed. And then neutral detergent fiber. So the fiber content of most grains is quite low where we'll talk about fiber in hay shortly. So just pointing out, you know, there's many advantages, lupins, you know, sim similar energy, but the protein percent of lupins is very high. So that's where we use grains like lupins mixed with barley if we don't have enough protein in our barley um, so yeah there's many differences and it's just pointing out I guess if you feed test you can make a decision about what's the best grain for the purpose there's also often in a dry season um, a lot of questions around alternative feed types so just pointing out here that it's important again to just look at what that feed type is delivering for you so when you look at things, you know, potatoes are probably pretty common in certain areas. Um, you're getting to around 20% dry matter. Um, so 80% of that product is water. And same as citrus pulp, that's quite a commonly used product. You know, energy is very high, um, but it's only contained in 14% of it, which dry matter and the rest of that's water. So when you're looking at freighting some of these byproducts, you've got to look at the percent that you're paying freight on that is containing the goodness for the, the animal. So it's worth sort of doing the sums on that before you jump onto something that looks like a good thing. So great marks, another one coming out of the wine growing region, Sparossa, mid North, um, but you know, only just over half of it's dry matter and the energy is quite low. So, you know, per kilo of as fed, you're only getting sort of three megajoules of energy. So you need to do your sums on that when you're looking at freight costs. The best um, supplementary feed calculator I really like that's easy for anyone to use is the New South Wales DPI one. So it's a drought and supplementary feed calculator. You can actually just put in feed tests or put in energy, um, protein, dry matter results on any ingredients and it'll do a comparison on, on it so you can work out what's the best value feed for you to feed. So if you go to dpinewsouthwales.gov.au, there's an animals tab and it has this drought and supplementary feed calculator listed underneath. So I've put in just common results for this year. So I've just put in barley at 90% dry matter, 12 megajoules per kilo energy, which is about typical 11% protein. And then I've compared it to, a so that was 270 a tonne, which is around the mark for barley at the moment. Um, I've put it against a full feed pellet which is 90% dry matter, 13 megajoules of energy, 14% crude protein. So that's a typical sort of U lamb type pellet um, at around 410 a tonne versus cereal hay. So lower quality cereal hay, 90% dry matter, seven megajoules of energy and 8% crude protein. That was only $130 a tonne. So we then go up and compare. So dollars per tonne dry matter, so if you put your byproducts in, that'll change a lot because the dry matter will be a lot different where these are all the same. Um, and then we look at, so for ewes that are late pregnancy or lactation, I'd be looking at the cost in cents per megajoule. So when you look at barley, it's come up at $2.50 per megajoule. Um, full feed pellet, $3.50 and the cereal haze, $2.00. Um, so, you know, obviously just on an energy basis, your cereal hay would be the best, but when you go down to protein, that's only sitting at 8%. So you are probably going to be well under what protein those lactating animals need. So you need to still take some other things into consideration, which I'll run through some of the issues with last season's hay, um, now, but that's a great resource if you're just trying to even if you're trying to buy feeds and you're not sure which one's best value for you. So the problem with last season's hay um, is the fibre levels were quite high on a lot of hay. So 
you know, even more than normal, I've been encouraging people to feed test because I've seen haze anything from 45% NDF up to sort of 60 to 70% NDF. So the season before we were getting sort of straw around 65 to 70% NDF and now we're getting high up near there from last season. So um, NDF, as I said earlier, is neutral detergent fibre. Um, and it's how we measure the fibre level and how much an animal can consume. So the problem with really fibrous feed is that an animal, especially in late pregnancy, has limited space, gut space for feed that they can eat and then digest. So as the NDF goes up, um, the digestibility goes down. So it takes up a lot of gut space and it can take them quite a while to digest that fibrous feed. So when we've got an animal with a really high energy requirement, they just can't can't get through enough fibre to get through the energy they need. So I've just got these diagrams here. So this one on the left is what your green plant looks like as it's growing and if it's cut for hay at the correct sort of time. So you've got this thin cell wall. Um, you've got this high quantity of cell soluble um, cell solubles in the middle. So that's the part that contains the energy and the quality ingredients we want in our hay. So if it's cut at the right time, your hay will be lower NDF um, and it will be quite high energy. Um, the problem with our hay last season, especially with the rain that kept coming through, um, not all of it was cut at optimum time. Some of it got rained on. Um, what happens as the plant matures is this outside cell wall gets thicker. Um, so we end up with a higher NDF and the NDF and this thick cell wall is basically the cells that give structure to the plant. So as it matures and you see a sort of stubble or, you know, quite structured dry hay, um, your NDF is going to increase on the hay and then your energy generally goes down because these soluble cells in the middle decrease in size as the cell wall increases. So that's where we sat with most of the hay cut. Um, there's still some good quality hay around, but it's worth seeing a feed test to know what you've got in the shed or getting your, feed, your hay feed tested. So just taking you through. So this is a very typical barley cereal hay out of the mid-north um, from last season. So, you know, dry matter always sits around that, you know, 89 to 92% for hay. Um, so as I said, that's just a percent that's dry and the rest of that is moisture at 8.4%. So a lot of people get, get confused because there's so much on a feed test, but I'll just point out the things I want you to look at. So if you can see my cursor there, um, just the crude protein of this hay is quite good at 10.9% of the dry matter. Um, then we look at NDF. So don't even worry about the ADF. We'll just go to neutral detergent fiber that we just talked about. So that's quite high at 67.4%. Um, and then we've got our metabolizable energy down here. So that's 8.4 megajoules per kilo dry matter. So, you know, that's probably about average for hay that was cut last season. And as I said, that's closely related to digestibility. So medium digestibility, you know, lower, starting to get lower energy. So that's the only things you need to look at on the feed test. Um, is the dry matter, the crude protein, the NDF and the energy. So the problem with this really fibrous feed, I'll just run through an example, is for a 65 kilo Merino U, um, so there's an equation that you can use to work out based on NDF how much an animal can consume. And it only works on quite fibrous feed. So you only use it on straws, hays to work out maximum intake. But it's basically just a set equation, which is 120 divided by the NDF of that feed is the percent of the animal's body weight they can consume. So showing you with this 65 kilo U, so looking at this barley hay, which looks quite good, it came back quite high fiber. We've done the 120 divided by 67.4. So that U is only going to be able to eat 1.78% of their body weight of that feed that hay. Um, so based on a 65 kilo U, it's only going to be able to consume 1.15 kilos of dry matter of that hay. So this is where we've run into trouble, I think, with early lambing, um, autumn lambing use. 
with the lack of paddock feed is um, throwing out a bale of fibrous hay hasn't always helped. So this hay at 8.4 megajoules per kilo of dry matter equals 9.7 megajoules per day of energy that you can get from the hay. So you can imagine a twin bearing ewe that needs 18 megajoules um, that might be getting three or four out of the paddock and 9.7 from the hay, they're going to be well underdone um, of what they need for energy, which, you know, lack of energy, um, twin lamb disease or preg tox is what we've seen a lot of this year. Just looking at an example, so twin bearing ewes lactating on hills country. Um, so we're looking at a 65 kilo ewe at 20 days lactation. So as we said earlier, um, this is around that 30 megajoules per head per day requirement. Um, so the feed available, you know, so I've worked on short grain pick at 300 kilos dry matter per hectare, which is just a short carpet of green like we're seeing everywhere. So, you know, maximum amount I'm estimating from that they'll get is five megajoules per day. Um, so, you know, supplement requirements, if we look at good quality cereal hay, they can get eight megajoules out of that. Um, so we're looking at them consuming 800 grams a day at 10 megajoules. Um, but the key here is um, the energy dense feed. So rather than just the hay and the short green pick, we're looking at 1.2 kilos a day of barley, which is 13 megajoules of energy per kilo. Um, so that's going to give them 15.6 megajoules per day. So, you know, I quite like also full feed pellets if people aren't able to mix grains or aren't very set up. But looking at energy dense, low fiber supplements in years like this is the only way you'll be able to satisfy those total energy requirements. So I'm looking now this 65 kilo U from that ration will get 28.6 megajoules per day. So slightly under the 30 they require, um, but they're going to lose a slight amount of condition, not critical, and then their requirements will start to drop off. So I guess when we're looking at feed budgeting, we're looking at, you know, following those requirements, you know, once you're 60 to 80 days post lambing, um, the lactation requirement starts to decrease and we can look at things like creep weaning um, or wean, early weaning lambs if we're pumping too much feed into the use. So I guess the key take homes that I hope you've got from this session today um, is just what your animal does require to produce the lambs you're after, the wool you're after, um, and I guess reduce the ewe mortality in our flocks um, that we're seeing in a bad season or late season like the one we've got that we're dealing with at the moment. Um, the other one is just how much feed is there in the paddock and how quickly will it grow? So I guess I just want to emphasise that, you know, even with the good rainfalls we've had in most areas, it's not going to turn around overnight. So, you know, I'd be looking at at least that six to eight weeks of feed budgeting, getting through lambing or getting through the next six to eight weeks of lactation or even for the spring lambers, you know, meeting some of those early um, you know, requirements that are going up towards lambing with supplementary feed if their paddocks aren't going to grow quick enough. A uh, question to, I guess, take to your agron agronomist, can you boost pasture growth? So looking at those tools we covered, like urea or gibberellic acid. Um, and then I guess I want you guys to be really aware of what is the right supplement. So feed testing for starters but looking at is hay going to meet your needs? Um, you know, maybe it will if it's high quality and you've got single bearing ewes. But if you've gone to the effort of scanning twins and splitting them up, um, in most cases, you're going to need more of an energy dense supplement. So looking at what you can access and what you can handle. So whether it's a full feed pellet, a barley loop and blend, oats, um, whatever you can access and whether it's going to meet that animal's needs. And then also how long you need to be budgeting for. So yeah, thank you very much for that. Hopefully that's answered a few of your questions. Um, but if you've got anything else you would like to ask, you can contact me. That's my phone number and email. Um, and yeah, thanks as well as Jody thanked initially to all of the people that supported this webinar and enabled us to deliver it to you guys tonight. So I'll just hand back over to Jody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Deb. Great webinar. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming through and I encourage people as they're reflecting 
on tonight's webinar to pop your questions in the Q&A box. If you can't find that, you can always pop it in the chat box through to me. So failing that, you've probably got my mobile, flick me a text. So I'm um, going to find a few questions here, Deb. A um, quick one that yep. came through is about feed testing. So where do you send it and how do you get a test and how much does it cost? Yeah. Yeah. So I use, there's a lot of different companies that you um, that do do feed testing. You can correct me, Jody, but I don't reckon there's any in South Australia, um, but I use feed test in Victoria. Um, so yeah, I think their websites, if you just Google feed test, um, their company's called feed test. Um, and you can basically just download a submission form. Um, otherwise, if you call them, they'll send you out an envelope with the grain and hay bag um, and the submission form and postage is paid. So if you ever see me around, I've normally got a fair stash with me. Um, and yeah, it basically you just throw it in the bag, fill out the submission form and you get the results back quite quickly. Like once I've received it within normally two to three days. So it can help with decision making, especially if you're going to purchase hay. So sort of cost, Deb, for a basic um, feed test? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So there's a, I reckon there's is $58 plus GST. So yeah, I do hundreds of them a year. I feel, um, yeah, there's definitely a lot more people starting to do them. I think in a year like this, where there's so much variance in feed quality, um, it's definitely money well spent. Great. There was a question that came through quite early on, Deb, um, and happy if you want to take it on notice. So um, there was questions saying, would there be any reason um, we are having problems with ewes having prolapse before and after lambing? We didn't used to have this problem um, until probably the last five years. So just wondering whether you wanted to make comment on that. Um, it's probably a little bit hard to answer without um, getting a lot more detail um, and happy if that person wants to give me a call. Um, Cause I'm probably, I'm quite interested in prolapse just because of the containment U project I'm running because I've seen quite a correlation, I guess, between the higher quantities of supplementary feeding and um, change in muscle regime, I guess, for some use that have come off hills and things and then lack of exercise. We seem to be seeing quite an increase in prolapse. So it'd be interesting to know the situation behind that question. Um, the other things that are well-known contributors are excess protein in a ration. So often if the protein's way too high, you'll get prolapse pre-lambing um, or if tails are cut too short and things like that can contribute. So um, yeah, happy for that person to call or email and I can work through that a bit more substantially. Fantastic. Um, and Deb, I think you've answered this one. Um, probably best to go to your agronomist about how much urea or gib acid per hectare people should be applying. Yeah, so, I mean, I worked on, I did some budgets on it, um, which was around 80 kilos a hectare of urea that was around the $6. So, you know, that's what's recommended, you know, probably post that rain when it's still wet. And then I think, I'm just flipping through my notes, I reckon I was working on two grams of gibberellic acid, but um, at a cost of $20. But yeah, I would definitely, sorry, 20 grams, yeah, per hectare of gibberellic acid. So yeah, definitely consult your agronomist or a pasture specialist will definitely be more equipped. But I guess when we're looking at the economics for it, that Evergraze calculator probably is good. Um, because I guess you've got to look at the response to the quantity of urea and the amount of supplementary feed it's going to replace and then look at the economics of how much urea you apply. Fantastic. Thanks. Another one here about um, different types of hay and the cereal hay provide better energy requirements than pasture hay or um, what types of hay? Oh, yeah. and I really think this comes back to feed tests because I've seen some really brilliant clover um, ryegrass type hay this year um, and it all depends on the stage it's cut as well so once hay starts to flower sort of you know digestibility starts to decrease quite quickly NDF goes up energy goes down so um, yeah there's and you know vetch and loose and hays can be very good energy quite a lot of protein um, and cereal hay just ve vary varies considerably depending on when it's cut so yeah it's Varieties, um, you know, I think it's more about time of cutting. Blender varieties can definitely help. But, yeah, I think just feed testing is the way to go. I wouldn't buy, you know, ryegrass, clover, hay, just because I've seen a good result from one place. I wouldn't buy it from the place next door. You've got to look at each individual lot of hay. 
and probably worth mentioning too when you're doing hay um, you know coring the bales and doing you know sort of 20 bales out of a stack so you get a good samples perfect so you know just grabbing a handful from one bale doesn't really represent a whole paddock. Yep great another question here about vaccinations and supplements and how you um, and the importance of those in at this time did you want to make a comment? Yeah so you know, obviously vaccination, I probably look at, you know, you're covering your major clostridial diseases with a six in one, but I probably look at the highest risk of with the amount of supplementary feeding we're doing as they get closer to lambing is pulpy kidney. Um, so yeah, I encourage sort of a pulpy or a, a vaccination booster as they're going on to an elevated regime of feed. Um, and obviously you're wanting to keep that booster pre-lambing anyway. So you know, I have definitely had people that will bring it back a little bit so they cover that um, change in feed plus also get the coverage for the lamb if it's not too far off from lambing. Um, and then also just looking at your lamb protection with vaccination. And then I guess on the supplement side, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm a strong advocate, I guess, for calcium when you're feeding large amounts of grain because the calcium phosphorus is way out of whack. Um, most of the ewe deaths I saw last season and this season have been due to hypocalcemia and preg tox. So, you know, I think, and I'm talking my mid-north area through to further north, we just go from stubbles to grain feeding. There's just a calcium deficiency in everything we're putting down their throat. Um, so yeah, I really like a good quality calcium magnesium lick four to six weeks out from lambing and then calcium right through as your grain feeding prior to that. But yeah, happy for you to email or ring again with specific questions on those things. Yep. Um, another question here, which um, is a sort of a common one is around acidosis. So when you're running with such a high grain diet, um, what's the best way not to lose used acidosis? Um, they're using lick feeders in this example. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd, um, you know, going back to the mineral side, I guess there's there's plenty of good quality additives that are used in lamb feedlots that contain high levels of buffers. I quite like putting something like that in with the grain, you know, especially when you're talking, you know, one to one and a half kilos of grain for a lactating twin bearing ewe. It's very high amounts for that animal's rumen to deal with. Um so yeah, buffers can help, but the best method is just gradual introduction to grain, which is hard with self feeders because as you guys know, you'll have a mob sit on them for ages and then you'll have 10 that decide last minute they're going to jump on the feeder and eat a kilo and kill themselves. So, um, you know, trail feeding or feeding in troughs to build them up can definitely help. And then having your self feeder on sort of a low setting and um, yeah, identifying any shy feeders before you've opened it up too much. But yeah, I guess we find in a dry year like this, I've had quite a lot of people go from stubbles to small amounts of grain and then we've increased it quite gradually as they get through to lambing. So, you know, often with ewes, you won't have the acidosis issues you will have with lambs when you're quickly trying to finish them. Um, the other method is TMR, so total mixed rations. So anyone you know, in the cereal areas that's supplementary feeding ewes, I've definitely had a much better result, less prolapse, um, you know, less acidosis issues if you can use a mixer and do a total mix ration rather than just grain on its own. Great. Um, and that sort of flows into the next question, how best to feed this? So, you know, I guess there's a few options, trail feeding or um, lick feeders. You know, what is, what's the gold standard yeah. um, and then what are the other options? Yeah, so feeding on the ground always brings with it a few issues. Um, worm burdens for one, um, you know, you can get coxie and sort of disease that's in the soil. So I don't love feeding on the ground in the same spot, you know, when you're talking in containment or dry paddocks. Um, but, you know, for some people, it's the most cost effective, easiest method of feeding out, you know, especially when you hope this is a one-off and we're not going to be feeding like this forever. Um but yeah, cell feeders are brilliant, I think, at just use realising there's feed available all the time. So you just don't get that real running to the cell feeder um, if you're able to ad lib feed. So, you know, I definitely still do have people trail feeding um, and we probably put out a little bit more than they need. So, you know, two days later, they're not sprinting and leaving lambs and running to that trail. 
Um, and as I said, TMRs in troughs work brilliantly. You know, even total mixed rations fed out of a mixer into a paddock can work quite well in a dry year. But yeah, I guess my main goals are to not feed on the ground for ongoing periods of time and, um, you know, and having feed available ad lib, however that looks to you. Great. Thanks, Deb. Um, and on that, um, do you want to make a comment around allowing for wastage? Um, we've talked about 1.2 kilos of barley um, we're going to feed per day. Um, how much wastage should we allow in various situations? Yeah, and I guess that's the thing when you, you know, when you're looking at a self feeder, you're going to have pretty limited wastage, um, or even feeding in troughs or you know guttering or anything you've got available on the ground. You're not going to have the wastage that you're going to get if you're trailing on dirt. So um, it'd have to be, you'd have to allow twenty percent, I reckon, at a guess, sort of for trail feeding um yeah there was a murdoch uni project that i reckon is about to start maybe next year that'll cover sort of trail feeding versus self feeders so it'll be interesting but yeah i think practically you know you guys see what works um i just want ewes not to be running for a trail so you know there's people that have definitely got around it by feeding a bit more or, or sneaking out in another area of the paddock or yeah mixing up how you're feeding Yep. Um, there's another question, a comment here, and um, if you care to add to it, about they've had a lot of lambs this year with scabby mouth prior to marking. Um, have you seen that this year, Deb? Any comments in that space? No, I haven't actually um, seen that at this point. Um, and whether that's damage, I mean, I've seen probably a lot of, I guess, immunity disorders in a way just due to nutrition, um, dust, you know, unnatural feeding environments, I guess. So, yeah, some of it, I guess, you could just put down to that. But I spe haven't specifically seen an increase in that at this stage. Yep. Um, certainly well worth revisiting our webinar from last month um, where we had Mary Rowe talking about vaccination from, and she also covered scabby mouth in a vaccination webinar last month. And that's on the Sheep Connect YouTube channel if you care to revisit that if you've got some questions about scabby mouth. Um, one last one here, Deb, um, just before we finish up. Um, toxicity um, issues with some of those alternative feed type, types that you sort of covered before. Are there any known ones there? Um, probably, yeah, probably more imbalances rather than toxicities in those specific feed types I put up because I guess they're the more common feed sources I've put up, but there's obviously other byproducts you'll get that you would have to watch toxins I always look at you know silage wet feeds um great mark and things you have to be careful of like mycotoxins and molds and things like that um but yeah there's probably more issues in some of those as far as mineral imbalance so you know potatoes and onions for example are very calcium deficient so if you're feeding them to, you know, growing stock, lactating ewes, late pregnancy animals, you need to be very careful with calcium because you'll definitely get more of that hypocalcemia without adequate supplementation. So, yeah, it's probably more looking at the balance of them. And there's definitely upper limits for some of those products. So, you know, you might only put them in at 20% of the overall diet. So you're still going to need your grains, haze and those. So it can reduce the ration costs, um, but... I often find, you know, if byproducts get too high as a percent of a ration, your performance will often go down. And Deb, thank you for sharing your insight and expertise with us. Um, if anyone's got any additional questions, you can contact me directly by using the contact information. Um, thank you for your time and enjoy your evening. And we look forward to you joining us for our next Sheep Connect webinar. Have a lovely evening. Thanks, Deb.